All right. Farming the great frontier, not an easy thing to do, as you could see. I mean, as we've talked about all the different things you're gonna experience being out there. Um, so irrigation was a big one. Um, and the dry farming technique is what they use. Most people, when they moved out there, could not afford the price of um, the labor that it would cost to drill a well, to dig down deep, I shouldn't say drill, but dig down deep enough to hit water, very expensive. So what they would use is the dry farming technique. Um, the farmers were really good about knowing when it was gonna rain and they would push the dirt out of the way. And when the rain was coming, and they'd get out there and manual labor, you, you know, clear a field of dirt. And then the rain would come, create a big pool of water, and then they'd throw the dirt on top of it and plant crops in, uh, in that, on top of that water. And uh, it would work pretty well. Uh, but, you know, it was tough when there was droughts because you couldn't do that kind of thing. But it, it will later contribute to the Dust Bowl in a big way um, as the roots of the plant are only going to go down as far as the water is. And when you don't super soak that dirt and get the water deep down inside, the roots are going to just be at the top. So when, uh, you know, the 1930s, when uh, you have a drought uh, a couple of years uh, and then wind storms would come up and it would, you know, blow all that soil away because it didn't have roots for years of, from years of farming down to anchor that soil. So nowadays in that area, um, obviously they have wells and they, there's a tremendous amount of water underneath the plains that we didn't even know about at this point. We do now. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's the way that they were able to survive on, uh, you know, and, and be able to water their crops was the dry farming technique. A mechanization helped farmers too with the invention of the steel plow, John Deere, and then the McCormick Reaper that we talked about in previous chapters and a twine binder that would not only cut, but use the reaper uh, to cut the, say, wheat, and then the twine binder would put it in bundles to be picked up. So it made life a little bit easier for farmers. It was very still very difficult. There's the steel plow right there and the McCormick Reaper. All right, let's talk about the Oklahoma land rush. Uh, if you remember from when we talked about Andrew Jackson and the Trail of Tears, Oklahoma, which was more than just the state of Oklahoma today, the Oklahoma Territory included a lot more than that, but it was a big gigantic reservation for Native Americans. And it was set up by the Jackson administration uh, when he was president in the early uh, 1830s is when they set this up. Well, as more and more people began to move out west, there was a desire to take Oklahoma from the Native Americans because it had a lot of rivers that ran through it. Uh, they know now that that soil is very fertile. So there was a push to do something to get the Native Americans out of Oklahoma. So they said, well, huh, didn't the, uh, some of the tribes that lived in the Oklahoma territory have slaves? And the answer is yes, they did back in the day. So in order to punish them for uh, what happened with slaves in, Oklahoma, in, 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 Oklahoma, in the Civil War, what happened in the Civil War, obviously, is they took the land away from them. They used that as an excuse to force the Indians off the land in Oklahoma, and they opened it up to American settlement beginning in, uh, on April 22nd, 1889. Um, and then in 1907, Oklahoma became a state. They did, if you look at this map right here, they did it, they released the land in sections. Here's, here's what it, it was, free land. I mean, we're talking about land that you didn't have to pay, like the Homestead Act was a fee of $30 for 160 acres. Oklahoma, the land was free. They opened it up in sections, and the first section being right here in the middle. It was open in 1889. They started in the middle of this area, and they said, all right, at noon on the 22nd of April, 1889, uh, the bells and whistles are going to go off and everybody could rush in and get the piece of proper property that they wanted. Obviously, the most valuable pieces of property were those that were close to a water source for uh, watering your crops for irrigation purposes, as well as transportation of crops down a river that might be a tributary, tributary of the Mississippi River. Um, so ease of, of getting your crops to market also was another criteria and getting a great piece of land. 
So needless to say, there were fights over land. Uh, there were those people who jumped the gun, uh, meaning they went in before the noon at, on April 22nd. Uh, maybe in the middle of the night, they'd sneak out. And if anybody would find out about it, they could potentially, you know, get shot. But they would, they would go in and they'd get a choice piece of land. And then, you know, when everybody else came around and lo and behold, they were the first ones to get this great piece of property along a river. Those ones that jumped the gun on the 22nd were known as Sooners. That's why Oklahoma, the uh, University of Oklahoma, they're called the Sooners. It's for those people who uh, went in before everybody else illegally and took territory. Um, so yeah, that's how they opened up Oklahoma. And there's some pictures right there of everybody on, on that date on April 22nd waiting for the the you know bells and whistles to go off. And here they are right after they went off. And you might settle in this area and build yourself a sod house like this picture of people in Oklahoma after the land rush. Frederick Jackson Turner wrote an essay uh, entitled The Significance of the Frontier in American History. And he presented this paper to a special meeting uh, of the American Historical Association at the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition Fair in Chicago. Um, his, it was his assessment of this, the shrinking of the frontier and how devastating that is going to be. He called the frontier a safety valve. Um, and interestingly enough, he thought that the reason that this country hasn't exploded in uh, revolution, that, that the lower class hasn't risen up against the upper class, like a Marxist type uh, scenario, is because of the availability of free or very, very cheap land in the frontier. And the fact that by 1893, the frontier was coming to an end, that it was no longer possible for you to be able to go out and get that free land or very cheap land, that it might cause tensions to rise in the East, and that at some point you might have revolution. So he worried about that. Uh, Frederick Jackson Turner's significant si significance of the frontier in American history was uh, widely thought of by a lot of people. Um, and uh, it hasn't happened. Obviously, uh, revolution has not happened. Uh, but it's just an interesting take on the, the significance of the frontier and how important the frontier is. Frontier farmers, some things, some ideas about frontier farmers here. If you're going to move out there, you better have a cash crop, whether it's wheat, whether it's corn, whether it's barley, whether it's, you know, whatever, uh, cotton in some places, they needed to have some kind of cash crop, a crop that would bring them money. Uh, there were Montgomery Wards started the first uh, catalogs. They, they brought, uh, you, you'd get a, a big catalog would come to these farmers and they'd look at it and they'd get clothes, they'd get tools, um, you know, anything that they can't toys for their kids, just like we would go online and buy things. Well, they do it by way of catalogs. There was uh, less and less jobs out there due to like the McCormick Reaper mechanization. Uh, is an, uh, the McCormick Reaper is an example of mechanization that took jobs away from people. Uh, so that's why a lot of these people would end up going back to the cities like we talked about in the last chapter. All, farmers wanted to blame banks and railroads for all of their issues, but the fact of the matter is, is they could have made things better for themselves with leadership and understanding of business, which most farmers at this time did not understand. Picture the farmers of this time as, you know, that farmer with the overalls and a piece of hay sticking out of his mouth and a pitchfork. That's kind of what farmers were like during this time. Today's farmers are not like that. They're highly educated. Many of them are, are Ivy League educated. They wear suits. Um, they're not the ones out there necessarily working the fields, although some of them do, but they usually are very, very educated and understand business as well as farming. So mm, a big problem with farmers, probably the biggest problem of all was what I like to call the big O. And the big O was overproduction, right? They produce too much, which is gonna cause the big D. And what I mean by the big D is deflation. 
overproduction, if you produce too much of something, the price is going to go down. It's the economics 101. There's an example of a mail order catalog right there, Montgomery Ward. You might buy a steam engine as to pump water out of the ground. So here's this idea that I just talked about that the big O causes the big D. For a farmer, deflation, devastating. Farmers always owed money to banks usually. And if you owe a thousand dollars to the bank and you, your crop is going up in price, inflation, it makes it much easier to pay back that thousand dollars. On the flip side, here's when it goes bad. You have a thousand dollar debt, but the amount you're getting for your crop is going down deep through deflation. You're producing too much crop. The price is going down. Now it's going to be much harder to pay back that $1,000. All right, pretty simple understanding. Deflation dooms the debtors. If I have a house payment that's $2,000 a month and my pay goes up every year, it makes it easier and easier to pay back that debt. If my and the amount I make it at my job goes down for some reason, then it's gonna be really hard to pay that $2,000. So farmers hate deflation. They really want inflation. There, and we know that farmers' solution to the problem, just print out more money. It's called greenbacks, money that's not backed by gold. That will cause inflation, but the business people are afraid of too much inflation. How do you control that? So yeah, there's that age old argument between farmers and business people to print out greenbacks or not to print out greenbacks. We all know that the solution is free and unlimited coins of silver. You had uh, organizations like, and I've mentioned them before, Granges, Grange meetings, the National Grange of the Patrons of Husbandry. Patrons of Husbandry were an example of, of a, a fraternal organization, brotherly, social, educational dances, picnics, informally getting together, talking about how the farmers are getting screwed. That's level one. Right. They attempted to do some things, but it just wasn't formal enough. The next step would be to form alliances with other farmers. Like, let's say all the farmers in Salinas decided that they were going to cut their lettuce production by 10 percent so that the price would go up at the market. Right? That's an informal agreement made, an alliance made between farmers. What's to say that one farmer isn't going to say, ah, all those 15 farmers over there are going to cut their production. The price is going to go down. So I'm just going to raise my production a little bit, see if I can make a little bit more money than they are. Very selfish, but there's no laws against it. It's just an alliance. It's an agreement. You know? But what they really need is true leadership. And in the last chapter, we talked about the populist party. That When you have a party that represents farmers that's nationwide, then you're talking about getting some leadership there. And you're talking about leadership. So this guy on the left right here <laughs> represents what the farmer was back then, right? But he, this, this slide right here sums up a lot of things with farmers. The biggest problem for farmers, the big D, deflation. The cause of the big D is the big O, overproduction. They're producing too much. I mean, look at it. They've got mechanization. The McCormick Reaper, it's great, but it allows you to produce a lot more and harvest a lot more, I mean. The steel plow allows you to plow the fields faster so you can plant more and faster. Fertilization makes it grow faster and, and more efficiently. So they love all these tools, but it's causing overproduction. The farmer solution, greenbacks or compromised silver. The real solution, leadership. You've got to inform these farmers that they have got to cut their production. But farmers back then looked like this guy. They didn't look like today's farmers in a suit with a and highly educated. All right, let's shift gears a little bit and talk. We're still in the Gilded Age. So it's a time of many, many strikes. And one of the biggest and most well-known strikes in American history was the Pullman strike located in Chicago. It was led by American Railway Union leader, Eugene B. Debs. Eugene B. Debs led the union and, and convinced the workers at, at the Pullman uh, yard where it was a company town, and I'll show you what I mean by that in a minute here, to go on strike. 
and uh, you know they were their wages were cut, and they were being paid in company script, and they couldn't use that company script outside of the Pullman organization. They could only they lived on the job site. It was a company town. And here, this is when, you, again, you, another, another example in history of government siding with the owners of the business as opposed to the workers. The Attorney General of the United States, Richard Olney, felt that the strikers were interfering with the transit of United States mail to and from Chicago. So what happens? They put Eugene V. Debs in jail, where he immersed himself in socialist doctrine and will run for president on three different occasions as a socialist candidate, by the way, side note. Here's what the company town looked like. Everybody lived on the premises. They would go to work here and you have the church, the stable, the schools for the kids, the playgrounds, the athletic courses. They were required to live on the premises. They were paid in company script. They would go to the company store here at the arcade and they would buy their clothes and their food and, and whatnot with the company script. Now, if you wanted to go off the premises, your money was no good. So it was a tough, tough situation for those people at, in, uh, at Pullman. President Grover Cleveland, we know he's the only two, the president to win two non-consecutive terms, that Grover Cleveland, said, and I quote this directly, if it takes the entire army and Navy to deliver a postcard in Chicago, that card will be delivered. And he sent the troops in, and here's a picture of them, uh, troops in to, to stop the the uh, strike from happening. And there they are around the arcade. I showed you the picture of where the arcade was. There it is, they're there to stop the strike. So Grover Cleveland has a distinction of being uh, a president to on two different occasions at the Homestead Steel Strike and the Pullman Strike to send in the troops on the striking workers. So the common man hated that. It, it's government siding with big business. Okay, once again, um, I'm, I'm going to shift gears again, and I'm going to talk about the tariff because it, it comes into play big time in the next election here in 1896. Um, so again, let me just emphasize that Democrats want to decrease the tariff. Republicans want to raise the tariff. Republicans want to raise a protective tariff to protect infant industries, and big business loves that. Democrats want to lower the tariff to get money in people's hands, and businesses hate that. The Wilson-Gorman tariff was passed by... Uh, and signed into law by Grover Cleveland. Grover Cleveland was a Democrat. Um, and this new bill included a 2% tax on incomes. So an income tax, which at this point isn't legal yet, or isn't, they don't think is uh, constitutional yet, but they're doing it anyways. Uh, it, it did fall short of lowering the down to 41% because that's what the Democrats really wanted to do. And the Supreme Court struck down the graduated income tax part of it. Um, you know, the, the Democrats wanted the income tax so that they could tax the rich and give the money to the peop the common man. Um, the Democrats want to lower the tariff because they want money in people's hands. So big business hated, hated that. So in the election of 1896, a big thing in this election is going to be about, you know, free and unlimited coinage, a silver versus the gold standard right having your money backed by gold it's also going to be about the tariff and the the uh, republican candidate was william mckinley if you remember the mckinley tariff jacked up the tariff to the highest it had ever been in history so you know what this guy's about william mckinley was from ohio william mckinley was a republican william mckinley was promoted by big business big business wanted this guy to win because he was going to jack up the tariff as high as he could, and he was also about solid money and the gold standard. He said that all money needs to be backed by gold or else you can't make more money. He's a deathly afraid of inflation. On the flip side, you have the Democrat candidate who was formerly the populist candidate. He was a tremendous speaker. His name was William Jennings Bryan, and his nickname was the boy orator of the Platte. The Platte is, he's from Nebraska. The a river that runs through Nebraska is called the Platte River. So he was such a great speaker and he was speaking for the populace and representative from the Democrats heard him speak and said, that's our guy. He could control a crowd. He was a great, great speaker and he didn't even need microphones or anything like that. Loud voice, young, 
And they said, here's our guy. Farmers are, are loving that. The populist party, they're going to they're, they're going to be upset because they lost their candidate. But William Jenning Bryan is going to represent farmers. He was a farmer himself. And he's all about free and unlimited coins of silver. And he, he delivered a tremendous speech in Chicago that's well known in history where it's called his cross of gold speech, where he said, do not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. Do not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. So William Jennings Bryan is saying the gold standard is way too restrictive. We need to interject money into the economy so that the price of goods will go up. Deflation is killing us. Well, so that was his big thing. And, uh, you know, that was it, the, the, the deal is, though, that William McKinley was backed by big business. And here's an example of a guy right here, Mark Hanna, who was the owner of a company who supported who supported McKinley. And he called himself proudly a president maker because he's the one that promoted McKinley and he's going to be the one that really gets him elected. So big business and William McKinley are going to go hand in hand for sure. This thing was about gold or silver. If you were wearing a gold bug, you were a supporter of William McKinley. If you wore a silver bug, you were a supporter of William Jennings Bryan. It's the way it was at this time. A um, couple, couple, here's William Jennings Bryan right here. This political cartoon depicts the theft of the Democratic Party by the agrarian left during the presidential election of 1896. The Democrats are pretty upset by the fact that the farmers have taken over their party. Uh, and it says your conservative Democrat Grover Cleveland pursues his Democrat donkey as a policeman, right? Grover Cleveland right there. He feels like he's being, the presidency is being stolen from him. Uh, he wanted to run again, but the party said, nope, we're going with this young guy who's a great speaker. Uh, campaigning, I mean, $16 million was given to McKinley to campaign with. Uh, William James Bryan had $1 million. And, you know, obviously the money talks and they were able to campaign for McKinley. And McKinley gained a lot of votes. And because of the amount of money that was thrown his way by big business, William McKinley is going to win this election. And there you have it right there. You can see um, the outcome. You have the electoral vote count. 61% goes to uh, McKinley and 39% goes to Brian. And, you know, when in the uh, popular votes, it's pretty close, right? 51% to 47%. So the new president of the United States, 1896, uh, is Republican William McKinley. Uh, the results of this election, McKinley won decisively, getting 270 electoral votes, mostly from the East and Upper Midwest, as opposed to Bryan's 176, mostly from the South and the West, farm states. Victory for big business, and it was a victory for big cities. Right, Big business is celebrating. Big cities up in the North, like New York and Philadelphia and Boston, are celebrating. And here, political cartoon, uh, confirm the nation's commitment to the gold standard a victory for the forces of conservatism. So gold triumphs over silver in the election of 1896. Important that you understand that. Now, during this time, the Gilded Age is going to come to an end. And, you know, some things are going to help McKinley out in that inflation kind of naturally happened. Um, you had the things got better after the Depression of 1893. Um, you know, so things happened. There was gold found in different places that interjected more money into the economy. And generally speaking, the, um, the economy got better. Now, I'm going to talk in class about uh, the allegory that was the Wizard of Oz and the Gilded Age. Uh, most people believe that Frank Baum, who's the author of the Wizard of Oz uh, book, he was wanted all the, this was like a, a a microcosm of what was going on in society in, during the Gilded Age. So I'll talk about that in class. And that's the end of chapter 26.